Father, it's with the intrepidation we come before you because we believe that when we call upon you, you're there for your word tells us so. So now asking your Holy Spirit to take over the sanctuary and wash from us all impurities of spirit, all impurities of the flesh, all impurities of thought, God, that we would, we would now look to you and we'd be radiant. And we look to you and your spirit would give us purity of word and there would be no corruption of your text, no corruption of, of my word. God, may my words be your words. May my words be fewer and fewer and your words be many. May my thoughts may they be directed by you, Holy Spirit. We invite you inside to do whatever you want. Holy Spirit, we're not afraid of a miracle. We're not afraid of a, a wondrous sign. We're afraid that you won't show up. That's the only thing we're afraid of. So by the power of your spirit, anoint your word, anoint our hearts, that those that need a good word from you would receive that word of exhortation, those that need a rebuke, those that need encouragement, those that just need comfort, those that would just need salvation. Today, all these things, by the power of your word, would come to pass. And we'd all look to you and we'd believe, saying, isn't God good? God is good. These things we ask by your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. If you've ever taken a, a journalism class, the first thing they do is they tell you when you're writing a basic article, you got the who, what, where, why, and how. Right? Who, what, where, why, when, and how. Who, what, where, where, why, when, and how. The last few weeks, we've looked at all these things. Who, what, why, where, when, and how. Actually, we didn't look at why. That's today's why. I screwed the whole thing up, but you got the point. We saw who. Who. Who came to the Jews? Jesus. Where? Bethlehem, Jerusalem, land of Judea, Israel, right? When? About 2,000 years ago. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Who, what, where? How? That's what we looked at last week. By the death of the cross, by his death on the cross, by the shedding of his blood, the Jews often wondered, when is this going to stop? You see, we're looking at two separate issues here. We're looking at salvation. We're looking at sanctification. We're looking at freedom, and we're looking at life. I'm going to explain all these things to you in the fullness of time today in, in the sanctuary, in the study. Man, my words aren't coming today. Guys, pray for me. How? I said that. Why? Here's why. Everything we look at today is why. In John chapter 10, we're going to look at it, it says, For I came to bring you life and life abundant. There's such confusion in the camp of Christians. They come to church, they get saved, and they can't figure out why they're still stuck in their old ways. And they condemn themselves. They even damn themselves. I'm not saved. If I was saved, I wouldn't be doing this. If I was saved, I wouldn't be doing that. And just likewise, the world looks on and says, what's different being a Christian and being what I am? Look, they still do the same thing I do. Look at them. And they mock. And they condescend. Call us all kinds of names. But let me tell you, and we've said this many times, the world isn't looking with a mocking tone because it's superior. The world looks at a mocking tone because they're hopeless. They don't look and go, ha, ha, look at those stupid Christians. They waste their time. I was out partying all Saturday night. Those idiots get up and go to church on Sunday morning. Ha, yeah, look at him. Oh, I know a Christian just got divorced. I know a woman just cheated on her. I know a Christian that. But let me tell you what's going on in their heart. I thought it would work. I thought it would work. If it's not working for them, it can't work for me. Because they're miserable. They're hurting. They're dying. And they mask their pain and confusion with mockery. So why is this happening to us? Why does the Christian 
marriage look like the worldly marriage? Why does the Christian man, the Christian woman, the Christian child, the Christian teenager, why is there so little distinction? Well, let me tell you what the distinction is. First and foremost, the distinction is our destination. Distinction one, destination. You call upon the name of the Lord, I don't care what your life looks like, you're going to heaven. That's a great and glorious thing. However, the option here for you, Christian, is what kind of life are you going to live till you get to heaven? You can live a life of misery, hoping you don't slip on the ultimate spiritual banana peel that drags you to hell. We can live an abundant life. And you could say, how's marriage? It's hard, but I got the best woman in the world. How are your kids? Oh man, my teenagers. Whew. But God's been so faithful. You can live like that. You can live like that. For 20 plus years, you could say, I married my best friend. And things just keep getting better. God directed my steps. He moved me to this. He moved me to there. He changed. Oh, God's been so amazing how he changed my seasons of life. Or you can be like those other ones and you just come to church and go, well, I've seen God doing this in his life, so I'm going to make believe God's doing something in my life. Oh, yeah, when I fight in the cage, man, I fight for the Lord. <coughs> Do you really? Oh, when I sell houses, I'm a real estate agent. When I sell houses, man, it's, it's for the Lord. No, I don't, I, don't, I don't play. It's for God. Is it really? And I don't say that in a condescending tone. I just want to knock. Come on. Because I'm going to show you today what it looks like for real. Stay with me. Read with me. Chapter 10, verse 1. Him, here now again, the writer of Hebrews explaining to the Jews exactly what he's talking about. For the law, having a shadow of the good things to come and not the very image of the things, can never with these same sacrifices which they offer continually, year by year, make those who approach perfect. Again, give me your attention. Him making his argument, making his claim, taking their very book. Their, their, he's taking the Torah and he's saying, listen to me. If you sacrifice over and over again animals, they can forgive of sins for the moment, but they can never make the sacrificer perfect. It's logical. That's why the Torah says you have to continually offer sacrifice. Continually offer sacrifice. Are you understanding me, Jewish person? Are you getting this as well? For then would they not have ceased to be offered. For the worshipers, once purified, would have no more consciousness of sins. He said, if you were the Jew, and maybe you're new to Scripture, maybe you're new to Jewish, Israeli uh, tradition, religion, you'd have a sin that you committed during the week, and at the end of the month, you'd take a lamb, a ram, an ox, a goat, something out of your flock, you brought it up to the temple, and you said to the priest, I screwed up again this week, no problem. You put your hand on the goat, they open it up, it dies, the blood is spilt, they take part of the innards, they put it in a big cauldron, they boil it, they have a big barbecue later with the meat, but something had to die for the Jews' sin. Something had to die. Sin costs. But you know what happened again the following week? Same situation. But let me tell you what couldn't happen back then. The Spirit not living in the Jew, the Holy Spirit not having sealed the Jew, but would occasionally come upon the Jew. You guys remember Samson? The Spirit came upon Samson. You guys remember, um, there's a couple other guys, in, where the Spirit came upon them. But the Spirit never lived inside of the Old Testament saint. He says here that it never freed you in your conscience. You knew all you had to do was go back you could go screw up all you want. Do whatever you want. Here's my, here's my goat. Here's my ram. The next week. And let me tell you, that's how I lived as a Catholic. Funny the parallel between an Old Testament a Jew and, and, and a modern day Catholic. I was the same way. No matter what I did, I messed up my life so good. It didn't matter. Every few months, I'd go to church, drop a cookie, say I'm sorry. Boom, I'm free. Did it change anything in my conscience? Nothing. You understand? I hope you do. Help me. 
all the way up there. But, all, but in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. For it's not possible that the blood of bulls and goats can take away sins. The blood of bulls and goats, he, the writer says, it can't take away your sin. It just covers your sin. Big difference. Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, now he quotes from a psalm, what's called a prophetic psalm, a messianic psalm. He says, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you've prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sins, you had no pleasure. Then I said, behold, I have come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do your will, O God. Previously saying, sacrifice and offering, burnt offering and offering you, and for sin you did not desire, nor had pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Give me your attention. He's trying to make a case with them, with their own book, against their own law. He says, if it's written in the law, again speaking to you guys that are Bible students, Bible scholarly types, true Jews, in the law it says to sacrifice, 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 sacrifice. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin, right? Then how come in the Psalms he wrote sin and offering, sacrifice and offering you don't desire? How could it be both ways? Either you found the contradictions or there's something better coming. One of the day. Because you know that's what the world loves to tell you. Ah, that Bible's full of contradictions. Yeah, can you show me one? No. I thought you said it was full of contradictions. Well, that's what heathens that are going to hell say about the Bible because they don't want to read it. Fair enough. Verse 9. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. So he says, First scripture says you must make a sacrifice, but then the same scripture says sacrifice you don't desire. Then the same writer that he's speaking of said, I came to do your will. So what is the will of God? I'm glad you asked that question. He takes away the first, that he may establish the second. By that will, we have all been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. The Jew, hopefully at this point, especially the Christian Jew, because this book was written to the Hebrews, is reading it and going, holy crap, that's right. Yes, I'm seeing it. I'm getting it. The light is being shed. Yes, I get it which is hopefully what happens at the end of our services. Some of y'all, maybe that have no knowledge of Christ, are going, yes, finally, this is what draws me to this place. It ain't that whacked out guy that's preaching. It's that guy whose broken body rescued us. It's not for the entertainment value. It's for the growth value. What do you mean growth value? I'm glad you asked that question too. He says... He says, help me. And every priest stands ministering. You know, I'm going to get glasses eventually. I promise, guys. I swear someday I'm going to... Don't be a wise guy. I don't need him yet. I'm only 48. And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. And that's when the Jew hopefully is scratching his head going, yeah, well, I do if I... If it forgives my sins, then why do I have to keep offering them? When is Messiah going to come and take away sin? Not just blood of the goats and bulls that cover sin. Verse 12, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sin forever, sat down at the right hand. From that time, waiting till his enemies are made a footstool. And oh, what a prophecy that is. The scripture talks about the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. And that's what the Lord Jesus is doing right now. Oh, he came and he died for our sins. But let me tell you something. The baby in the manger, he's coming back as a conquering king on a white horse with a rod of iron to crush the nations. And let me tell you, just for a side note, you don't want to be on the wrong side next time. Right now you could mock Right now, the world can say all they want. Right now, the papers and the media, they could say this and say that. They could have commercials and advertisements making fun of our Jesus. But let me tell you something. The Bible says that all the nations will mourn him whom they've mocked. They will fear for their lives because our king is coming back. Amen. He's coming back. Verse 14 
for by one offering he had perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Watch what he says there. He perfected you forever, those that are being sanctified. And now here's the confusion, and here's where the message kind of turns to a how-to. You're perfected, meaning you're going to heaven, but you're still being sanctified, cleansed, you're growing doesn't make much sense to the outside, especially to some Christians who thought that I, all I had to do was jump over some line. Now all of a sudden I get it. Now I'm great. I'll never drink again. I'll never have sex again. I'll never. You fill in the blank of whatever your sin is. I'll never look at pornography and whatever. And then a couple of months go by, and although you felt strong, I stumbled again. I'm telling you, this thing ain't real. Either that or it's real, and God hates me. God doesn't love me because he's not given me strength. For by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Verse 15, But the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us, for after he had said before, This is my covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts, and in their minds I will write them. Here is the promise to the Jew. Yes, You can't be freed from your conscience, not as a Jew. But here's the promise he makes to the Jew and to every other one who believes. Eventually, I'm going to take my law, the very law of God, and I'm going to put it in your heart. And I'm going to put it in your mind. And you will have what's called conviction. You know what I hated about coming to the Lord? I came to the Lord, and my life was so jacked up. I was, if you've heard me describe, I was the brand plucked from the fire. I have no idea how I got saved. Nobody in my family is a Christian. I just one day found myself going to church for like a year, and I was like, eh, this is a lot of fun, great. Maybe the girl won't leave me now, and she'll stop bothering me about all the terrible things I'm doing to her, who, thank God, is now my happily wife. At least I'm happy. (laughs) But my life was so messed up, when I went, after I accepted Christ as my Savior and tried to go back doing all the things I used to do, they didn't feel good anymore. (coughs) Like, this was no fun. I'd have stayed in the world if I knew, you know, I didn't know how to describe it to myself back then. It's like, now all of a sudden I feel guilt. What is that? That's the Holy Spirit. He puts this little seed inside you, man, and it just, it doesn't feel good anymore. You know, you're not getting that satisfaction. It used to be, you knew you're doing wrong, but it didn't matter, you were doing it anyway. Now it was like, it don't even feel good anymore. You know what that's called? Salvation. You know how many people come to me and they go, oh man, I messed up and and they're depressed and uh, my life is terrible and I'm supposed to be a Christian and I'm doing this. And I go, well, praise God. And they go, praise God for what? I said, if you didn't feel guilty, you wouldn't be saved. Yeah, but I'm still doing it. Then stop. I can't stop. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Verse 17, then he adds, their sins and lawless deeds I will remember no more. That's exactly what we've all been waiting for. Now, where there is remission of these, there's no longer an offering for sin. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated us through the veil that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Please give me your attention. He says, once the Spirit's upon you, once he comes up and lives with you, listen what you've done. Remember the first thing he said in our chapter was these are images of things that aren't real yet? Well, now he goes to the New Testament thousands of years later, and he says, now it's real. Now it's no longer the image, now it's real. And by his blood, you enter the veil. Remember we talked about the temple, how there was the outer court, and then the the inner court, and then behind the veil was the holiest of holies, where the very presence, the Shekinah glory of God dwells. He says, don't you understand? Because of his shed blood, because of the spirits in you, you come right in now come right in. What is he talking about? Guys, he's talking about prayer. Prayer. That's step one. You want to grow? You want to not just get saved, but want to have abundant life? Pray. 
This whole thing was done. Why was it done? Just so you could spend time with your creator. We thought God was some magical, mystical force who just blew things into his ears. It's not. He loves us. He wants to spend time with us. He knows what you did last night. He knows what you did last week. He knows what you did last year, five years, ten years. He knows. And he says, I love you anyway. I love you anyway. I put your sins away. I didn't just cover them. You don't need to make an offering. You're there. Come to me now. Oh, gee, I can't because I did this, because I did that. Stop. That's a lie from the enemy. Let me... I'm going to give you an example. I'm going to give you an example. I'm going to put a caveat. I'm not using this as a way to make people feel good about their sin. I'm using it as a way for people who are in their sin who want to get out. So if, 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 if I'm saying something that you think it's okay to do something, that's not what I'm doing. However... I meet people all the time and they tell me, you know, I just really like smoking herb. It helps me go to sleep at night. It relaxes me. You know, I have a bad back, so I take these pain pills. It's not that I want to. You know what I say to them? I say, keep smoking. Keep taking your pills. Just go to church, pray, and spend time with the people of God. Oh, well, I'm gay, and I've been to a church before, I've heard, and, and people at church don't like me because I'm gay. And I say, you come to our church. We have no problem with gay people. You go to church, you read scripture, you spend time praying and and be as gay as you want to be. Why do I say that? Because if you do these things, slowly but surely, one by one, God will take them from you. God will do the work. You can't do it. You can't. When you get saved, sometimes it's miraculous. I've seen crackheads get set free. I've seen prostitutes walk away from the life. I've seen God do the miraculous. And when, when he does the miraculous, I rejoice with him. For me, it was my mouth. Foul mouth, grew up in New York, truck driver mouth. Literally overnight, every time I cussed, it was like, I was afraid God was going to beat me up every time I cussed. Are we still cool? And it's like I heard this voice going, yeah, but you can stop cussing now. That's kind of like who I am. I'm really creative with my cussing. It was like within a month, gone. And I thought, man, salvation, this is a good thing. I just waited for God to take away the lust of the eyes. Yes, soon he's going to do that. Then I talked to brothers, and they were walking with the Lord five years. How do you do with the lust of the eyes? Mm. Ten. Mm. Twenty-five, thirty years, guys I talked to. How do you do with the lusty eyes? And I remember an old, old guy one time, 70, said to me, you know when you're set free from lust of the eyes, Ryan? When? When you die. <laughs> so that sounds very promising. <laughs> he says, let me tell you the trick. And I go ahead. He says, keep your pants on. I think I can do that. Not that I want to. Not that I feel like it, but I can do it. You can't. I think it was uh, Ruth Graham Bell who said, um, you can't stop the birds from flying over your head, but you can stop them from nesting in your hair. (laughs) Verse 24, and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Prayer and church. He says you want to you be sanctified? You want to grow in the Lord? You want freedom from those sins? You don't want to feel condemned? You don't want the world to look down at you? I'm going to tell you how. I did it because I want you to have... Colon, turn to John chapter 10, please. Verse 1 says, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice. And he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. 
the Lord Jesus, and if you have one of those Bibles, you'll notice that it's in red. It's because it's the, it's the words of our Lord. And although we take with the most, although every word of the Bible that we read is precious, there's something about those red words that make you look a little bit harder, a little bit deeper. The Lord Jesus uses an analogy here, a picture, especially for the person that was brought up in the agricultural, the agrarian society. He said, sheep, in case you don't know, sheep get very attached to their shepherd. And he, he start, you'll start to see that sheep, they have, each one of them have such a, a separate, unique personality. Some of them are constantly wandering. Some of them are constantly biting. Ow, man, what are you, stop. You know, I take my kids up to Georgia and they got these little sheep pens and these little tiny sheep like this big. And, and you, ever, you guys ever see the fainting goats and all that stuff? They're so funny. And they're, they all have such different little, some of them stand up. And the reason God made this is that's us to him. He says, and, and, and you know my voice. I'm your shepherd. And I know everything about you. And you know what? The one that wanders, I love him just as much as the one that stays. And you know, you, you know, I know you hear my voice, he says. I know you hear my voice. And some people, they condemn themselves because of the things they've done, because of the things they've said, because of the things that have been. And God says, you're my sheep. You hear my voice. I know you do. To him, the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice. And he calls his sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. You see, you're already, you're already in the sheepfold. If you're already in the sheepfold, then I should have everything I need. This is what the world thinks. You wear a Christian t-shirt. This is what you tell yourself. I shouldn't be struggling with these things anymore. Why? You're not allowing God to sanctify you. How many of you let a day go by? Do you understand? I remember being a young Christian, two, three years old in the Lord, and remembering a day went by when I didn't pray and thinking to myself, wow, a whole day went by and I didn't pray. It's like, how? How can you do that, Christian? It's like if you that are fathers of teenagers, especially, listen to this, teenage sons. When you have a son, now I'm not putting down daughters. I know it's, it's, it's the propensity of women to go, well, what about a daughter? Listen, stop. I'm just talking about sons. You guys that have sons, it's your boy, man. You raise him up and you roll around in the backyard and you jump on a trampoline and you go for walks and, and you wrestle. It's like, yes, God gave me a son. And you, you just love him to death. You're going to pinch him and you do things to him that women just never understand. And, and then all of a sudden they turn 12 or 13 and they stop talking to you. <laughs> and you find out that they've done some stuff that's like, I don't usually quote movies, but <laughs> there's a scene in The Godfather where uh, Don Corleone, the Godfather, is talking to Michael, and Michael's telling him how he's going to run the family business. He's gonna, I'm going to take care of it. From now on, I'm going to take care of it. And he looks at him and goes, I never wanted this for you. I never wanted this life for you. I'd hope when they talked about you, they'd say, Senator Corleone. Mayor Corleone. And he says, he looks at his father and he goes, another pezzo novante. It's an Italian word. It's like another one in the system, another one of the puppets. And that's what happens to fathers. We look at our sons and something happens. And it's like, no, I don't want this. Always be my buddy, please. Always be my buddy. Come on. Talk to me. And that, that's what happens to the father's heart when we spend a whole day when your teenager walks in your house and you know he's mad at you and he doesn't even acknowledge you're there, she doesn't even acknowledge you're there, and you're like, you <laughs> live in my house, you eat my food, you breathe my air, and you're going to walk around like you're mad at me. Then you're going to get into the car that I bought for you. Now, thank God, that God doesn't feel like we taught us. But let me tell you what God does when we spend a whole day without prayer. My son died. He's 
that you could enter the veil. It costs a lot so that you can pray anytime you want. Don't spend some time. Come on, let's, let's do this together. Oh, but God, I'm really busy right now. It's just business is just so busy right now and there's so much to do. And God says, really? You want it to be not busy for a while? I'll spend some time, God. You don't have to get my attention because I can do all kinds of fun things to get your attention. I think I can wake up a half hour early and spend 15 or 20 minutes with the Lord in prayer every single day. And in that prayer, not only is it exchange that you bless the Father's heart, but guys, this is where the growth occurs. This is where you will start to grow and get spiritual strength. For you guys, if you're on the computer at work, and like I've, I said before, I like Fox News Channel. I'm up Fox News. I'm seeing what's happening in the world. But sure is shooting, you know, Fox on those channels. I like the fact that it's news, but every other girl on Fox is some voluptuous, blonde bombshell. I was like, dude, I can't get away from this stuff, man. I'm trying to be straight here. I'm trying to not. But when you spend a lot of time in prayer, Spend time around God's people. Spend time in the Word. God will give you strength to say, nope, I ain't doing it today. Sorry, ain't going to win. And all of a sudden you look back and I can look 20 plus years now that I haven't cheated on my wife. Now for some of you like, oh, big deal. Listen to me. My father was a cheater. My grandfather was a cheater. My grandfather before him was a cheater. God, give me freedom. And every single day it brings tears to my eyes. Thank you, God that I don't have to look at my wife's face ever again and see that shame that I placed there in the past. And she's going to look at me with those eyes. I'm not, no, never again. Never again do I want her to experience that pain. Never again do I want to experience... Never again do I want to pray this prayer to God. God, whatever it takes, please don't let me hurt her again. Some of you guys know that prayer. I hate that prayer. I never want to pray that prayer again. Um, you remember where I left off? Thank you. Yet, they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. Now listen, how do you know the voice of God? Is it something you just know? No, it's something you start to recognize. You've heard me say this. I read this in a Pastor Chuck Smith book. Counterfeit hundreds... 20s, 50s, do you know how the counter, you know how the, um, the people who spot the counterfeits study? Let me start that over because I really screwed that up. If you study a, a 100, a 50, a 20, and you just look at it and you get used to every single line, every single jot, every single tittle, every single dot on that page, when the counterfeit comes along, you'll see it. You don't have to study the counterfeit. And I know it's some people's ministry. Well, I want to learn everything about Jehovah's Witnesses. I want to learn everything about Muslims. Listen, I don't need to do that. All I want to do is study the real thing. Because when the counterfeit comes along, I'll recognize, no, nah, that don't sound like it to me. That's not what my Lord says. That's not, how, that's not how my Lord makes me feel when I spend time with him. Do you understand this, ladies? When, that, when, Mr., when Mr. Smooth comes around, he starts giving you the old, yeah, I go to church at this church. and You're like, wait a second. Something about your spirit is just like, you're bringing me your spirit of seduction. Keep it to yourself. Keep your pants on, Junior. I'm not the one. Sure. Jesus used this illustration, but they did not understand the things which he spoke to them. Then Jesus said to them again, Most surely I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and find pasture. You enter by him, you are saved, but then you enter and you have to find pasture. You can't just save and go back, get, go back out there and think everything's great just because you received God in your life. You have to keep receiving. Let me explain something to you. My wife loves to look at houses. When we bought our house, we looked at about 30 houses. I'm not like that. I'm a hunter. This looks like a nice house. We checked off all the lit. Let's buy this house. Honey, we've only looked at four houses. That's a problem? 
My wife looks at house after house. My wife should be a real estate agent. She loves looking at houses. She loves showing it. If any of you guys are interested in buying a house, ask her for help. Oh, I'll go looking at houses with you. Are you kidding me? You ladies know what I'm talking about? Or is that like a... Me, I, and we, we bought the first house. We bought the first house. I told you to buy the first house. We bought the first house. Why did we look at 30 houses if we bought the first house? If you enter into his sheepfold, you will eat and be good at what you do. If my wife doesn't look at a lot of houses, she'll never get good at finding the right one. Now, somehow this illustration is going to make sense as I remember why I brought it up in the beginning. You've got to do something to be good at it. My wife looked at a lot of houses. Believe me, it would be seamless for her to become a real estate agent. <coughs> seamless. She's great at it. You know why? She's done it a lot. You want to be good at saying no to your flesh? You want to be no? You want to be no. <laughs> you want to be good at saying no to the things in your life that at this point in time you know you shouldn't? It's going to take practice, guys. It's going to take strength. You want to be an MMA fighter? You want to be good at jujitsu? You want to be good at being a cook, a chef? What do you got to do? You can't say to yourself, you can't walk into a restaurant and go, hey, can I cook here? And they say to you, sure, do you have experience? No, but I'm pretty sure I can be a good cook. <laughs> Why? I watched a lot of Emeril and Giada. Oh, I love Giada. I got an idea. Let's train a little bit. Let's work this thing out. Let's be good at it. What are you saying? Some Christians are good at being Christians and some aren't? That's exactly what I'm saying, guys. Otherwise, I wouldn't be up here preaching at you. Right now, I am training you. I am working you. And some of you guys are strong. And you're receiving it and you're like, yeah, come on, give me some more. Really? Hmm. Good point. Oh, man, I never saw that. Some of you guys are like, too much. Done. Man, how many, how long does this church go? Worship, prayer, oh my goodness. If he has an altar call, we're going to be here forever. I was up late last night. Come on, dude. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. But I'm hoping that you guys are going to get to that point of strength where you could sit there and go, come on. Come on, give me some more. I am. Because <laughs> here's the thing. And I'm using this as an illustration. I, you guys I know I use this because it's my life. And I want you to be able to put it to your life. Training, I'm at the gym three days a week. Actually, I'm there four, but don't tell my wife. I train about two hours a day. When I'm doing jujitsu, if another guy comes along and he only trains a few hours a week, I'm annihilating him. But when I'm going with the pro fighters, these guys that train 10 times a week, four or five hours a day, there's a level of strength, a level of consistency, a level of athleticism. Forget it. I got no shot. I might want to be better. I really want to be better than them. I want to say it, but it ain't going to happen. You all look at me, and some of you guys, you look at me and go, man, I wish I had a relationship with my wife that you had with yours. You bet you do. And you think it was easy? You think it's easy? Oh, man, I wish I could get up in the morning and, and study God's word. I just, I can't be, uh, you, how long has it been? Listen, you guys, I haven't looked at pornography since I was like 15, and I'm 48. Some of you guys are like, man, how do you do it? It ain't easy, but I'm strong now. Because every day I'm up in this word. Every week on Wednesday and Sunday I'm in this church. Throughout the week I'm talking to brothers and praying and texting back and forth verses. I'm practicing. I'm practicing. This is what he's talking about. This is what the writer of Hebrews is talking about. Let's finish this. Verse 10. The thief does not come except to steal 
and to kill and to destroy. But I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. More abundantly. Not just life, but life abundantly. Not just salvation, but sanctification. It's not like a luck of the draw, guys. It's not like, well, I'm going to save Matt, but I'm going to really screw up his life. He's going to struggle with pornography and drugs all his life, go through two divorces, because it's just not in his plan. No. Matt's strong, man. And when he got saved, he got serious. And he started studying the Word, and he plopped his butt down in church and stayed there until God called him elsewhere, even if he didn't like what he was told. I don't like this guy. He says things I don't like. He checked his word. And he didn't just believe me. He said, Ray, what does it say that? I'm going to go look at those Proverbs. Sit at his right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. What does that mean anyway? He looked it up. He checked it out. He lived the life. And I find out that some of you all that do ministry, I didn't even know about. And I go, hallelujah, he gets it. He gets it. Found out the corns were doing base one five. That's what I've been waiting for. Miserable, if you don't have abundant life, if your marriage sucks, if you're miserable at your job, I'm telling you, whatever it is, fill in the blank. Your relationship is stagnant and stale. We'll sit down in my office and I'll say to you one of four things. Tell me about your reading. Tell me about your prayer. Tell me about your church. Tell me about your worship. And just like a car with four wheels, I guarantee you there's flat tires. I'm not just talking about trials. Everybody goes through trials. I go through horrible trials. Horrible trials I go through. Somebody threatened to kill me and to rape my daughters. Right? I wanted to smash him so bad. Little tiny sawed-off runt whose family the church had blessed and we ministered to. And I just... Oh, he just, he just said that. He said that, that. I'll kill you and I'll... That's a trial for me. Stuff like that happens to pastors all the time. But I had to be strong. God save him before I kill him. Come on. No joke. This is real. This is serious. This is not make-believe. This is not a social club. Come here, receive salvation and you're wondering why your life is flat, stale, and stagnant, I'm asking you the question, what tires flat? Is it the worship? Is it the church attendance? Is it the prayer? Is it your Bible study? Those four things, they'll make you strong. You want to be a real estate agent? You better study the laws. There's certain things you can and can't do, especially in the state you're in. Certain states, you can't be the real estate agent and the show, you can't be the seller and the shower or something like that. You guys, your agents know what I'm talking about. Certain, you can negotiate the deal, oh, 6%, 5%. You better know. You can't just go out showing houses. My wife can't just decide she wants to be a real estate agent because she's seen a lot of houses. She's got some studying to do. Want to be a chef? Got to do more than watch Jout on TV. Well, I've watched a lot of Rachel Ray. <laughs> How's your palate? What? Your palate. You have a good palate. You know the difference between savory and sweet. What are you talking about? You ain't a chef. <laughs> My wife's a chef. You know why? Because she's cooked thousands of meals for us. Thousands. How many of you can say, My wife is the best cook ever? I can. My wife is the best cook ever. She cooks better than my mother, and that's saying something. My wife decided to be good, cook, good at it, and she taught her daughters how to be good cooks. If Austin was here, he'd be jumping up and down. You had to see, this kid was skinnier than that flagpole when she met him. <laughs> I ain't even joking. Isn't it incredible? Right. You know why? Look at Mike, he's talking about food. He's got a fight coming up in March, and he's like starting to cut weight, and he's like, yeah, she made some great food. <laughs> you got another one of those around somewhere? <laughs> okay, I've got You got it. 
If you need me, we're here. Elders and leaders will be here. Be at the baptism. If you've not been baptized, it's the first commandment. It's also a great way to receive strength from God, to know that you've made that first step. God bless you guys. I love you. Have a great rest of your weekend. If you're watching the, the, the Super Bowl, pray for the players that they're safe. These guys are going through hell right now. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Your word is supernatural, powerful, incredible, amazing, great. And any other word we could think to describe what we aren't, you are, your word is. Bless us as we go here. May the lessons learned be applied for wisdom, be applied for strength, be applied for, as your word declared to us, abundance. God, we want to have an abundant life and we want to hear your voice. The things that we heard today, we don't just want to know about them, God. We want to live them out.